Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we're talking about arguments for the existence of God, and this time we'll discuss the cosmological argument from contingency, or as I like to call it, the contingency argument. I think this is one of the strongest arguments available for the existence of God, and it's the one that first convinced me. The argument can be understood in simple terms to be based on the mystery of why there's something instead of nothing. So, why is there something instead of nothing? To that, theists have a good answer, and I've never heard a sufficient atheistic answer to that question. Still, a question isn't an argument, so now it's time to set an actual argument forth. However, before outlining the premises of this argument, there's one more thing I want to go over, because there are a few words in this argument that aren't usually used in conversation. Here they are. 1. Contingent. Depending on something else that might or might not happen. 2. Necessity. The quality of being unable to be changed or avoided. 3. External. Outside of. Now, on to the argument. Premise 1. Everything that exists has some explanation of its existence, either in having a necessary nature or in some external cause. Premise 2. If the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God. Premise 3. The universe exists. Conclusion 1. The universe has an explanation of its existence. Conclusion 2. Therefore, the explanation of the existence of the universe is God. In this argument, there are two conclusions. The first one follows from the first and third premise, and the second one follows from the second premise and the first conclusion. Now let's look at the evidence for the three initial premises. Premise 1. This premise implies that there are only two possible kinds of explanations for the existence of anything. Either it exists necessarily, like numbers. For example, nothing caused the number 3 to come into existence. The number 3 just exists because it's necessary for it to exist. Or else it was caused by something, like an ear of corn being caused by the corn stalk that it grows out of. What this means is that in order for anything to exist without requiring a cause, it needs to have a necessary existence. This is sort of obvious, since we always find explanations for every physical thing that we encounter. Small rocks, for example, have causes, and so do big rocks, so do mountains, so do planets, so do stars, so do galaxies. So do clusters and superclusters of galaxies. No matter how big or how small an object is, it always has to have some explanation why it exists. All of the evidence that we have confirms premise one. Premise two. There are two means that one might use to try to undermine premise two. The first is to claim that the universe does in fact have a necessary existence, and the second is to claim that the universe could be caused by something other than God. I'll address these as objections 2 and 3 to this argument, but for now, it's sufficient to say that if both of these claims are proven to be false, then premise 2 must be true. Premise 3. Very few people will try to deny premise 3, because if the universe doesn't exist, then neither does anything in it. Therefore, neither does the person objecting to this premise, therefore they are not making an objection, and there's no reason to bother answering a non-existent objection. Conclusion. As long as all three premises are true, the conclusions follow from them. This seems like a good argument. What kinds of objections could be brought against it? Objection 1. Premise 1 is usually a good rule of thumb, but it doesn't apply to the universe, because the universe just is all of time and space, so nothing could happen before or outside of the universe to make it come into existence. Therefore, the universe must just exist without an explanation. Reply. The problem with this objection is that it assumes that nothing exists or can exist outside of time and space. Putting aside the question of whether this claim is likely enough to be worth denying premise one over, this assumption is essentially the same thing as naturalism, the belief that the universe is all there is, and it's impossible to be a theist if you're a naturalist, at least in the sense of believing that God created the universe. Because of this, the assumption that time and space are all there is assumes that God does not exist. That's a logical fallacy called question begging. 
Still, some people might claim that it's literally impossible for something to be before time or outside of space. Something can't be before time in the sense of being present in a time before time began, but it can be before time in the sense of existing in a timeless state and timelessly causing time to begin from that state. As for being outside of space, a thing would only need to be related to space in that sense if it was physical, but we're not talking about something physical, if we're talking about something which is spaceless. Objection 2. Premise 2 is weak, because for all we know, the existence of the universe could be necessary. Reply. The problem with this claim is that if the universe were necessary, a few things would follow from that which nobody wants to admit. To start with, it would mean that every atom, every particle, every quark in the universe would just exist because it can't be otherwise. That also means that there would be no such thing as free will, since if we can make free choices, we can freely change certain combinations of atoms in a way that we didn't need to, like picking up a book. Therefore, even if this claim were true, whether or not we believe it isn't up to us. We believe or disbelieve it because we can't believe otherwise, so there's no good reason to believe it. However, there's also something else that would suffer horribly in a necessary universe. Science. If the universe is necessary, then things only happen because they can't happen otherwise. However, science involves finding the reasons and causes of things through measurement and experimentation. And in a necessary universe, there just aren't any reasons to find out. Things happen the way they do because they can't happen otherwise, and there's no good reason for pursuing the question any further than that. In fact, in a necessary universe, there's no good reason to do anything, since the only reason why people make the choices they do is because they can't do otherwise. So, really, the whole process of learning and making choices is utterly meaningless. We don't really make choices, we just think we do. This is why almost everyone who studies this topic agrees that the universe is not necessary. Objection 3. Premise 2 is weak because for all we know, the universe could have been caused by something other than God. Reply. This objection can be answered by thinking about what would be required in order for something to cause the universe. To start with, since the universe contains all of time and space, the cause of the universe would need to be timeless and spaceless. This also rules out anything physical, since physical things need to have physical dimensions, and physical dimensions only exist in time and space. So the cause of the universe needs to be timeless, spaceless, and non-physical. Also, if the cause of the universe exists outside of time, its existence can't have a beginning or an end which means that it's impossible for it to not exist. Now already we have a problem. If the cause of the universe is able to create the universe, and also timeless, why isn't the universe timeless as well? After all, if the first cause is sufficient to create the universe, and is timelessly sufficient to create the universe, it should have always created the universe, and therefore the universe would have always existed, and would be timeless too. The only way that I can see of answering this question is to say that the first cause has the freedom to timelessly create temporal things, which implies that it can make decisions about how it creates things, and therefore that the first cause has free will. So we're left with the first cause of existence as we know it, which is timeless, spaceless, non-physical, tremendously powerful since it can cause the universe to come into existence when it didn't exist before, necessary, and has free will and the ability to make free decisions. You can figure out a great deal more about the first cause in other ways, but this is already enough to deduce that the first cause is what we would call God. Objection 4. Just because atheists don't have an alternative explanation of the universe yet doesn't mean they won't someday. Science is always progressing. Reply. To start with, this isn't a scientific question, this is a logical question, and it's not a matter of believing one of a number of competing explanations. The alternative explanations have already been ruled out. Therefore, the remaining conclusion is true. Besides, even if you assume that some future atheist philosopher might find a hole in this argument, that's still admitting that the evidence currently points to this argument being true. Therefore, we should currently agree with it. Objection 5. 
Premise 1 commits the fallacy of composition by assuming that the universe must have an explanation just because everything in the universe has an explanation. Reply. The fallacy of composition is only when you assume that because every part of something has a certain property, the whole thing must also have that property. For example, just because every tiny atom in the world is small, it doesn't follow that the world itself is small. However, premise one isn't like that. The conclusion that everything has an explanation of its existence is a logical principle, which all available evidence confirms and no evidence contradicts. Therefore, we have a good reason to believe it, and the fallacy of composition isn't involved in that reasoning. So it follows that God is the explanation of the existence of the universe, which is one of the strongest reasons to believe that God exists. Next time, can morals teach us anything about God? That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.